So Ruthie is going to have to put up with Bud for many years. <clears throat> we need to pray for her. Well, our text today comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has been describing the terrible conditions of the world in chapter 34. They, chapter 34 is a description that is apocalyptic. It's awful to read the judgments of God. But in chapter 35, God promises good things to his people. Look at Isaiah 35 and verse 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. And look at this. Behold, your God will come. He predicts that God himself is going to come and fix things. And he says, even, even God will come with recompense. He will come and save you. This is, this is not unusual, actually. The prophets predict the coming of God to rescue, to deliver, to help, to fix things. Just a quick uh, reference, Ezekiel 34, when the people were scattered. Ezekiel 34, 11, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will come and search for my sheep and seek them out. I'm going, to, I'm going to come down there by myself. The shepherds aren't doing it. I'm going to go do it. Or Malachi 3.1. The Lord whom you seek is suddenly going to appear in the temple. So this idea of God breaking into human history. Now what Isaiah does in distinction from all these other prophets is this. He tells us what he's going to do so you can recognize when he comes. How will we know? What are the evidences of his goodness? Well, let me give them to you briefly. We said Isaiah 35 verse 4. Uh, here, here's the first one. Say to them of fearful heart, be strong and fear not, your God will come. With, he will come with vengeance, with recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. So that's one thing. Now, in the Old Testament, to open blind eyes was a miracle because they didn't have optometrists and surgery, surgeons and they didn't have all that we have today. I don't even know if they had glasses. And here, something that's never, to my knowledge, there's not a single instance of healing of blind men in the Old Testament. But he says, here's a way you'll know that the true God has acted. The blind will see. Then number two in Isaiah 34, verse 5, he says, then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. In the same way that they're cured of blindness, they're going to be cured of deafness. Then number three, Isaiah 35, 6. The lame man, the crippled, he's going to leap like a deer. Our, our backyard backs up to, uh, to a, a small forest, and uh, there's a big fence, about a six-foot fence, along the way, and we have deer. We have about half a dozen deer that come in, and I can see those things. Sometimes they will just be in a standing position, leap over that six-foot fence. He says, 
the crippled man will leap like a deer. Then number four, this uh, coming Messiah, this God, this one who's God in the flesh, he will bring healing to the leper. Now, leprosy was different from other diseases. The leper was viewed as a leprosy was viewed as a judgment more than a sickness. You didn't just get leprosy. You were smitten by God and afflicted with leprosy. Um, so Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, says this one who is coming is going to uh, bear, he's going to take on himself this uh, leprous condition. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now that's the language of a leper. In fact, in the Old, Te in the Old Testament days, the, the rabbis read Isaiah 53 uh, and uh, verse 4 and 5 and, and called this the leprous Messiah because, because they use, it uses the words of the leper. And it says, Isaiah 53, 5, He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed. So he's going to be smitten like a leper is judged. You might remember Uzziah in the Old Testament, the king, uh, 2 Kings 15, where the king of Israel, they weren't permitted into the Holy of Holies or into the temple. Only the priests were permitted. But Uzziah, in his pride, tried to go in, and what did God strike him with? Leprosy to the day of his death. See, it was a judgment. But here, this, when, the, when this uh, Messiah comes, the deliverer, he's going to take on himself. God's going to smite him instead of those who deserve it. So the leper would be healed because he would bear their, pay for their sin. A fifth thing he would do is raise the dead. Well, that's a pretty remarkable thing. That's good evidence. Isaiah 26, 19. All of these that I'm giving you are from just one prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead will live. Your bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. <laughs> Out of the corpses comes a choir. The earth will give birth to the dead. The grave is a mother when the Messiah comes. And a sixth thing he will do is he will bring good news to the poor. Well, praise God, the poor need some good news. Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me. That's the word Messiah in Hebrew. He has messiahed me to bring good news to the poor and bind up those who are sorrowful. So these are six things that God gives us as evidence that He has come, He has acted in human history, He has intervened into our sorrow, and has come to bring deliverance. Now let's go over to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11, uh, John the Baptist has come and has been preaching and He's saying that Jesus is this Messiah. John the Baptist is saying he's the one. Remember what he's... he's the, in John chapter 1 he said he's the, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when he baptized Jesus, 
he saw the Spirit descend like a dove and heard the voice of God, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. John had heard the voice of God. But a couple of years have passed and John has been arrested for preaching. And now he's in prison and he's wondering what's going on. Like, I thought he was the one. And yet here I am in prison. And the darkness and the doubt that settled over him. If he's the deliverer, why am I not delivered? <laughs> so he sends in Matthew 11, verse 4, uh, or verse uh, 2, When John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to Christ, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? John has lapsed into doubt and questioning. I mean, here's a guy who heard the audible voice of God at Jesus' bath, uh, baptism in Matthew 3. And he says... Um, Matthew eleven four. 4, Jesus answered them and said, You go and tell John what you hear and see. And then Jesus names six things. And guess what? They're all from Isaiah the prophet. He says, Here's what you tell John that you're seeing. Verse 5, Matthew eleven five. 5. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's the six things right out of Isaiah the prophet. What is Jesus do? Why didn't he just say, uh, yes, I'm the one? Why, why, why does he list these six things from Isaiah the prophet? And here's the answer. Because Jesus wants John to base his faith on a firm foundation of Holy Scripture. Can I get an amen from the church? Do you know what you need? You need something that's more assuring and more foundational than an audible voice. You need the Word of God. That's what you base your life on. That's the foundation for Christian beliefs. That's why the Christian faith is the, uh, growing, the most growing faith, expanding faith and in, in, in religion in the whole world. Um, almost half the world has now put, made a profession of faith in Christ. The, and the, the countries where it's growing the most is across the seas. South Africa, Iran, China. So, so Jesus is saying to John, put your faith in God's Word. And instead of just saying, yes, I'm Him, He sends him to that which will truly give him certainty and faith in a dark time. Peter actually does the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 1. Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration? That's where um, Peter and James and John went up with Jesus uh, on top of a mountain, and Jesus was transfigured before them. He says his face shone like the sun, and there suddenly appeared Moses and Elijah talking with him, and J Peter, James, and John fell on their face. And then they looked up and they said, Lord, we should build a tabernacle here for you and Moses and Elijah. And then a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. And they looked and Elijah and Moses had disappeared and Jesus stood alone. 
so that Peter heard this visible voice, saw this glorious glow on Christ. And here's what, in describing that event, it's in Matthew 17, Peter later in life describes this. 2 Peter 1, 16. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty when He received honor and glory from God the Father. And a voice was born to Him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. See, he's remembering back to the Mount of Transfiguration. A voice was born to him. And he says, we ourselves, 1 Peter 1, 18, we ourselves heard this voice from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mount. I've never heard the audible voice of God. I've had strong impressions that I knew were from God by the Holy Spirit. But never the literal voice of God. But listen to what Peter then says. 2 Peter 1, 19. After saying, we heard his voice, here's what he says, 2 Peter 1, 19. And we have something more sure. Wow. More sure than an audible voice? Yes, he says, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention. (laughs) That's what Peter says. We have something more sure than the audible voice of God. Uh, and, And I know Christians who hardly read their Bibles, and then they'll have some kind of dream And man, they just run with that dream. It's like, whoa, whoa, pull back. What does the scripture say about the direction you're about to go in? We have something more sure than what friends will tell you, what circumstances dictate, and John had bad circumstances. He also, he says, we have a more sure word than any kind of feeling that we might have or any kind of counsel from our our people who love us, something more sure that we can base our life on and the foundations of our faith, it is the prophetic word of God. I tell you, Jesus is the Messiah. He's God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. He's promised in the Old Testament. He's come into the New And I know it because of the Bible. I know it because of the Bible. Uh, Jesus loves me. This I know because I had this dream and an experience of emotion and I was so happy. No, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Amen. So what is Jesus doing? He's directing John back to the Word of God and not his circumstances. Don't look at the darkness of the jail cell you're in. Just focus in on those promises and know that I'm fulfilling the Holy Scripture. Now a couple of things. Matthew 11, verse 5, Jesus does add this statement. Matthew eleven five. 5. The blind receive their sight, lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, dead are raised up. Poor have good news preached, just like Isaiah said. Then verse 6. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Uh, why did he add that? Because I think, that, well, the word offended means to uh, stumble, to trip up. Blessed is the one who does not stumble over the way I arrange his life. See, John's in prison. Now, now John, you have the right one, but your expectations were a little off. See, my purpose is for you... And your expectations 
Two different things. So don't get tripped up when God arranges your life in a way that doesn't meet your expectations. God is not an American fulfilling all the American and westernized expectations. John's in prison. He's going to die there. They cut his head off, you know. Well, where's Jesus? Jesus is exactly who he said he was, doing exactly what he's supposed to do. And his purpose for John was now over. So we go to God and we say, God, I want your will. Remember Jesus' prayer? Not my will, thine be done. We give our expectations to God. Don't get tripped up. Don't stumble. When God uses you differently, has a different plan for your life than for somebody else's. Blessed is he who's not offended by the way I do things in your life. He gives him that counsel. But here's, here's another thing I want to uh, uh, give to you. And that is don't, don't judge yourself by your circumstances. Don't judge, don't evaluate yourself based on the prison cell you're in. Because he goes, Jesus goes on in verse 11, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there's arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said, I know he's in prison, but don't interpret his restrictions and his circumstances, his prison life, don't interpret that as that he's not a great man. There's no one born of women in this old covenant age that's greater than John the Baptist. So don't judge God. Don't be offended by him. Don't judge yourself. Just surrender to him. Say, God, I trust you. I trust you. And I trust your word. Don't judge the surgeon while he's still at the operating table or the mechanic when he first lifts the hood. Give God time. And I close with this this morning. I read to you from 2 Timothy 4.13 where Paul asked Timothy, these are in the last days of Paul's life. He says, when you come to me, I'm cold. Bring the cloak. And bring the books. Bring the books. Uh, Adam Clark commentary says that could be uh, Paul's own notes. Could it be commentaries? First century commentaries were, were available. And he says, bring the books. But then Paul says, above all, bring the parchments. What are the parchments? Well, there are two ways you can identify them. The word parchment in Greek is the only place. This 2 Timothy 4.13, that's the only place it's used. It's, and it's an ancient writing material. So it's old. The other thing he says that gives it away is, above all, bring those parchments, those ancient writings of old. So what do you think it is? Paul says, above all, bring those ancient writings. It is the Word of God. The old prophets. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. I want you to bring me a cloak because I'm, I'm cold. And I want you to bring me books because I'm bored. But most of all, for my soul, I need the Word of God. I need the prophets. I need Moses. I need men who spoke the words of God. Bring those parchments to me. See, when you get ready to die, you need the parchments. You don't want to be guessing and looking for an experience and, or have 
the pastor come and pray a brief prayer. Man, you need the parchments. The ancient writings of God. You need something for your faith to stand on that's immovable and foundational. And that, my friend, is found in this book right here that I hold in my hand. Aren't you glad we have it? We have the book. We, we have the Messiah. We got the right one. We, we're not offended when our lives get messed up and He doesn't fix them as quickly or in the way we thought He should. We won't trip up over that. We look at the book and we find we've got the right one. This is Him. And then this book, we, we look at this book and we build our faith on it. And then we're ready to face whatever comes in our future, including death. I guess I'm speaking along this line because the last few weeks in our church, not members, but the overall purview of the church, extended family, we've had at least eight, maybe nine or ten deaths. We find ourselves doing funerals, memorials. I want this church to be ready we never know when it's going to come. And there will be people here this morning that may not be here this time next year. Base it on the Word of God. We'll be good. Let faith arise, my friends, and hope in Jesus. Let's pray together. Ushers, you prepare as we are going to worship with our tithes and our offerings. And please don't forget two weeks from today, Thanksgiving Sunday, we're going to have a blowout on that Sunday. We're going to have turkey and ham coming out the rafters, packed to the rafters, and desserts and stuffing and uh, what's that purple stuff? Cranberry sauce. We've got to have cranberry sauce. And... Uh, so it's going to be a great day on November 21st, two weeks from today. Bring somebody with you. Let's use it for outreach. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I can't praise you enough that we have a foundation that's immovable. The written word of God. Our memories fade. Our experiences and our emotions are unreliable. But your word that's been here for 3,000 years, still with us today without error within it on anything it speaks, we thank you for it. And we put our faith in you and in it. In Jesus' name.